Hello everyone and welcome back to the Prehistoric Aquarium where today we're going to try and get through as many of the invertebrates as we can, starting with our new anomalic carry tank that we made last time. So I'm not going to talk massively about them as we've discussed them several times on the channel before, but basically these are the early ancestors of animals like shrimps that lived around 500 million years ago. This one is called Schinderhans, which I think is named after like... I guess like the German equivalent of like a bushranger, like an outlaw kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this is one of your basic garden variety animal like carrots. It's a small predator that hunted things like trilobites, it's done from the Burgess Shale Lagerstadt, and it has these little grasping appendages to grab hold of their prey. Very standard, we've talked about them a bunch before, but way more interesting. Way more interesting is this creature. So earlier in the series, we talked about suspension feeding and how animals like Titanichthys and Leedsichthys converged upon giant filter feeding, much like how whales and sharks have done since. And I also mentioned that the earliest known giant filter feeder was an anomalous carrot. Specifically, it was Aigerocassis, which was added when the mod updated, if you can remember that far back. And look at that, that just looks perfect. So these structures at the front are what it would have used to filter feed, and you can see these in the fossil record, that's what sort of suggests its diet to us, but also its size. The majority of suspension feeders obviously get really big. In fact, when this animal was alive in the early Ordovician, it was probably the biggest animal on the planet, which is pretty cool considering that the, you know, currently largest animal on the planet, the blue whale, had a very similar diet, does that make sense? And yeah, these things are great because their appearance in the fossil record also coincides with the evolution of plankton, which is what it ate. So, you know, it kind of immediately jumped on that niche. And then in this next tank, we're going to highlight a very different type of filter feeder. So this is a graptolite, and this looks rubbish. <laughs> you can barely see what's inside. So uh, let's try something different. So you know how museums will sometimes have like a little offshoot from the main exhibit, usually make it look like a cave? I'm thinking a little tunnel that loops around here, you can kind of either go this way or through here and out here. Yeah, and then what we can do is we can put these arrow blocks in order so you can show how they would evolve. It's all going to make sense, just bear with me. So this is what I've come up with. My shaders mod makes all the ore blocks really shiny, which adds like an extra little effect. And then yeah, this is the sequence of tanks. So even though these animals are pretty cool in their own right, it's really their, their evolution that I want to talk about. So Graptolites are colonies of creatures that floated around the oceans, we'll say roughly 400 million years ago, give or take quite a while. If you did geology in university or college, you will instantly recognize them because you'll have had to draw them in pretty much every single exam. So we have Tetragraptus, which has four branches. We have Didymograptus, that has two branches. And then finally, Monograptus, which has a single branch here shown in a sort of spiral, which is quite cool. And as you can see, the number and arrangement of these branches changes so noticeably over time that you can very easily use the arrangement of their branches to know where you are in history when you're looking at a rock that contains fossils of them. And yeah, all of these creatures would just freely float around and strain the water for food. So, giant sea scorpions. Um, this is really fun. We often get, you know, requests to talk about these. I think you're all pretty big fans of them. And this is great because we have seven different species to look at, not just one generic Eurypterid. So this group of animals lived for a very long time, from the Ordovician all the way up to the end of the Permian. They survived many mass extinctions. It was the biggest mass extinction that finally took them out. And in that time, they took on all sorts of interesting shapes and sizes, which again, as always, tell us a lot about how they might have lived. So Pterygotus and Jacalopterus are among some of the largest arthropods to have ever lived. They have really long claw-like chelicerae with huge spines, and this extra reach may have given them an advantage as some kind of ambush predator. Whereas this ridiculous animal, Hippotopterus, would instead use its much shorter chelicerae for sifting through sediment as opposed to actually attacking prey directly. These things are cute and harmless and unlike Apobamas are pretty quiet, so I'm tempted to just kind of let them roam free. You know how like some zoos just let peacocks do whatever? I was also talking to our co-host Dave Marshall who works on Eurypterids and he says that this is basically nature's Roomba, so uh, one second. There we go. Remember, if you want to name any of these creatures, leave a comment and I will do it in the finale episode. These are all looking so good. Oh, uh, this one, Myxopterus. We have fossil footprints of this animal that suggest it could have walked on land, but what it did, it looks as though it didn't actually use all of its legs, which suggests that some of its legs were actually only really used when it was swimming. We have loads of body fossils of these creatures as well because, you know, they're tough outer skeletons, obviously preserve really, really well. 
But this is the really interesting thing that I wanted to talk about. Way, way back at the start of this series, I mentioned that we have evidence of our lovely jawless fishes being eaten by sea scorpions. If you've ever seen that episode of Walking with Monsters, you'll know that they actually use a jawless fish as bait to lure the Eurypterids. And this is based on the fact that there are punctures on the fossils of jawless fishes that line up pretty perfectly with Eurypterid chelicerae. And I think if we grab a dead one, we can actually feed them to them, which is quite fun and different. So what I'm wondering is if we can set up some kind of automatic feeding system. All right, so this is like a solar panel. Every time the sun rises, it should activate this dispenser and drop a dead fish into the tank. Yep, that works. So there we go. That'll <laughs> keep him happy, I hope. All right, there's lots more invertebrates to get through, but first I want to sort out this miscellaneous box. It's really bugging me. This is Calbaria. Um, it lived in the Silurian, and I think it may have been one of the like earliest animals to actually leave the ocean and venture onto dry land has a very tough outer exoskeleton, which again, not only would have protected it from predators, but also from the sun. At this time, the ozone layer hadn't fully formed, so the sun was a deadly laser. We also have uh, this thing. <laughs> you can, can you tell I work more on fish? No, this is uh, Numid, oh God, new Numidis, Numodismus. Numodismus. <laughs> It's some early Devonian creature that probably belongs to the same group of animals as millipedes and centipedes, and I believe that if you go to Scotland you can find some neat little trace fossils of this thing. The same group also gave rise to Eoarthroplura, so you probably know Arthroplura, the giant carboniferous millipede. This is its much smaller cousin, and is again one of the first and oldest animals to leave the ocean. In fact, I think it's one of the oldest terrestrial animal fossils known from North America. All right, so this thing's super weird and really obscure. This is Inakitazoon. So this is one of those fossils that has just confused so many paleontologists since it was found like over a hundred years ago. Like Tully Monster, people have argued whether it was an invertebrate, like a crustacean, or some kind of early chordate, which is the group that contains vertebrates. But ever since it was found to have a compound eye and a segmented body, it's much more likely to be an invertebrate. People were so confused by this thing that for decades we didn't know which way round it went and it was actually reconstructed upside down for many years. So as a little easter egg just for us, I'm not sure if it'll work on these modded creatures, we can just, <laughs> there we go, flip this one over. This one could just be hanging out upside down, there we go. And yeah, over time we might add more sort of amphibious insects to this tank. Um, for now, it's just full of these weird jumpy creatures, but yeah, this will be like a dumping ground for the weird miscellaneous things that I don't fully understand. I've also installed this very dank, spooky little enclosure. It's got dripping water and cobwebs. And this is for our spider-like creatures, specifically a group of animals called Trigonotarbids. So Trigonotarbids first appear around 400 million years ago, and again, they crawled up onto land long before early tetrapods, which yeah, again, like all these creatures, considering they already had legs, just kind of makes sense. Eventually, however, once fish got their act together and did crawl onto land, Trigonotarbids were in trouble, they became prey, and we actually start to see them evolve almost armor, like spikes and spines in response to deter potential predators from chomping on them, as well as slightly longer legs so they could scurry away faster, as that one just demonstrated perfectly for us. There's one in particular I want to mention as well. So this is Anacopus. It lived in the early Devonian. I have to bring this up. This is... <sighs> right, to be clear, I really, really, really hate my country's obsession with, like, family history and heritage and all that stuff. It's super elitist and it's really gross. But I quite like linguistics and how a language evolves over time, especially when it relates to fossils. So bear with me for one second. Anacop is an old-timey word for spider. It's where the carbon cobweb comes from. And atta is an old Swedish word for poison or venom. That's where the snake adder, that's where its name comes from. Now, my surname is Adderby, which comes from a mining town in Sweden. The by suffix just means, you know, that's how Vikings named their settlements, like Thornaby, Grimsby, etc. Anyway, long story short, this fossil taught me that my name literally means village of poison. And that is sick as hell. Anyway, those are Trigonotarbid's early fossil spiders.